All right, good morning, everyone. This is Peter at AppSheet, and I'm joined by Jen remotely. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for taking time to um, join office hours this morning. We're gonna um, talk about a, vari a variety of things, but the, uh, the primary agenda is to do a little bit of getting started, um, kind of intro to AppSheet, and um, spend the first you know 15 minutes or so just kind of uh, addressing some of the essentials for how you get up and running, because I think we have a lot of uh, newer uh, faces joining. <clears throat> and then, um, and then we want to do a deep dive into actions. With if, which, if you isn't, if you aren't familiar yet, actions you can kind of think of as buttons throughout your app. Um, these are ways that a user will interface with the actual application and make changes and move throughout the app. Um, and so. Uh, we're going to do a deep dive into different scenarios there. Uh, some housekeeping. Um, we have a, a thread in the community right now called March 3 Office Hours. And this is where we'd like to start adding as uh, any questions that you have. If, you, if you're coming right now to the webinar with any questions already in mind, please add them here if you can. Um, and then uh, as we're going through, uh, please, you know, anything you think of, jot it down here. Jen and I will be keeping an eye on this, and then um, uh, we'll try to address them live uh, as we're able. That's a big uh, emphasis of office hours is to do live Q&A. So anything you come to, that comes to mind, uh, there's no question that is, uh, that is not good. And actually on that note, it's helpful for us to get a sense for how um, how far into using AppSheet you are already? And I, I want to run a poll real quick because I think we have a variety of um, uh, uh, app creators here. We have some that have been around for a long time and others that uh, maybe you've just joined or you haven't even joined yet. You're just sitting in to learn more before you before you get started. So I, so I, I put up this poll, real simple, just how many apps have you already created? Um, if it's zero, if you haven't even published anything or deployed anything, that's great. Um, we'll, we'll help you get started. And if you've been around uh, for a longer period of time and you've made a variety of apps already, then hopefully this deeper dive into some of these actions will just generate some ideas for how you can keep improving those existing apps that you've already made. So I'm gonna let this sit for a second. We also have others still joining the, uh, the webinar. And <clears throat> I'd say also, you know, the ideally the questions should get posted. Let's see, um, in the community. If you if you're not registered for the community and you don't want to, it's a pretty quick registration. But you can also post questions in GoTo, uh, and we'll be keeping an eye on that. But we're going to be addressing the community questions first. So. And I will add for the community questions, um, I'm actually going to respond to one right now from a gentleman named Bruno. Uh, what's great about these is they're crowdsourced answers. So a member of our team might not be able to get back to you quickly, but another app sheet expert can, which is absolutely fantastic use of this space. So please feel free and go ahead and add questions there. And if we can't respond directly, somebody else will follow up shortly. Cool. Thanks, Jen. All right, I'm gonna close the poll. The results, results are in. Um, there are a lot of significant polls, polling going on in the U.S. right now. Um, most significant is the office hours poll. And, <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, and, and so this is actually, it's a good sense for, for you guys uh, attending, uh, just for your, for your knowledge, about half of the people attending right now have not created any apps yet. And, and then around 40% have created, you know, a, a one or a few and then around 10% are at 10 plus apps. So uh, for, for the, those top 10%, hopefully some of these ideas around actions will be, will be useful for you. But I also, it'd be great if you could chime in with, with tips uh, for everybody else as, as you get ideas, whether it's in the community, um, uh, just, just leaving your comments on any of this is really helpful for the rest of us. So I'm gonna close the poll and let's get started. So I have, um, we'll just preview a little bit of notes in regards to actions and different types of actions that you can create within AppSheet. This is what we're going to get to um, in 15 minutes or so. 
but I just wanted to start it out, start <clears throat> everything out with some of the essentials for setting up an application to begin with, um, and just sort of uh, go through the journey of how you get to the point where you're fine tuning and creating custom actions in your app. Because there are a few steps before that that I think are good to have a handle on before we dive into some of this uh, more detailed customization. Um, so I have a scenario here, and I have a variety of tabs open uh, with, a, with a number of different scenarios that we'll, we'll, we'll get to in a bit. But this first scenario that we can just start thinking about AppSheet is what I'm just calling a note manager. So um, the, the application consists of a list of contacts, uh, I'm logging meetings, and then I, and I have a way of jotting down notes. Um, and I either jot down notes about people I'm meeting um, or people I'm meeting with. Um, so a meeting, uh, one meeting in particular may have a custom note for it, uh, or maybe, you know, uh, Jen and I have a conversation um, uh, just sort of offhand and I want to jot down uh, so I remember, uh, you know, what the takeaway was from that conversation, but, but it wasn't actually a scheduled meeting. So really just kind of a, a personal type of an organizer, personal professional organizer. And in this case, it, this application maybe is something that is shared within the team. So everybody has access to, uh, you know, kind of reference different meetings that other people are having uh, in, case it's, in case it's relevant for them. Um, so that, that is a really basic scenario um, that we're setting up. Um, and the way that we've done this is in AppSheet is we've connected a Google Sheet. And this, I'm gonna zoom out just a little bit. So this may be, um, if, if you have a process like this for tracking notes or tracking contacts or jotting down meetings, um, you know, it could be a sort of thing where you have just like a, a pen and paper and you're, you're recording those notes. Maybe you are doing it more in like a spreadsheet form or like in Google Docs, for example. Um, and so you you naturally could, if you are jotting this this sort of thing down in a spreadsheet, um, then that is probably the most natural transition into AppSheet. Uh, in this example, um, when you start building an application, it, you're thinking you can build this application from one of many different data sources, and Google Sheets is just a prime way of getting started. <clears throat> um, you could also be building this application from like a third-party app like uh, uh, Smartsheet or Salesforce, um, it, or it could be uh, more of a database source, so like uh, uh, Cloud SQL, for example. In this case, we have a really simple way of getting started. In this Google Sheet, I have a few different tables. And I knew when I when I set out to make this Google Sheet that I was going to be supporting an application. And so I've been kind of deliberate about how I've structured these tables. Um, and so, for example, I have a table of contacts. And we're missing some information. We'll just focus on the information associated with me as a contact for now. Uh, we've got a table of meetings that we're going to be logging. We've got some notes that may be applied. And then we've got this special table that is definitely unique to this app that we'll get to towards the end, which is uh, a log of interactions. The main idea here is all these tables I've connected to my application, uh, what we call the definition. So when I'm in the app sheet editor, really what you're doing is you're just defining the app definition, um, so how your users are going to interact with this data. Um, so what is it going to be the interface for them and uh, how are some of the actions and workflows um, behind the scenes going to uh, make that data available to them and maybe get updated as they're working with it. So this application could be right now, These we've connected those four tables. Uh, they just all happen to be within this one Google Sheet, but um, uh, this could be contacts. Uh, we could have multiple data sources all combined into this one application. So I could have contacts from like an HR database, 
I could have meetings that are coming from a, a separate um, a Google account. Um, notes may be logged in uh, in some other uh, cloud-hosted location. Um, for simplicity here, we'll just switch between the sheet, the sheet and this app definition. Now, for those of you that are newer, let's walk through. When I've connected these tables, each table has specific permission levels defined for it. And so contacts, for example, I can update and add, but I cannot delete. And what this means is as I've connected these tables, this is this is one of the kind of front lines of uh, how you're gonna be able to, of defining how you're gonna be able to interact with that data from that table in the application. So if we go into, if we change contacts to read only, then uh, you saw right away there, there are actually already some changes in the prototype. But what this does then is it ensures that any of the functionality that I'm creating, especially the actions that are going to show up, um, uh, no longer there's no longer any ability for any user of this application to modify the data in this table. So uh, that's a good thing to be thinking about as you're getting started and you're connecting. Uh, I'm going to refresh here and not save this page, save this update. But as you're connecting those tables, that's a good thing to keep in mind. As you get more um, specific about the level of access you want for each table, you should start thinking about security filters. And so a good example of how security filters might be applied in this scenario is, um, you know, in this case, anyone that accesses this app will have access to all the notes and all the contacts that are available. But maybe you know every contact or every note should be personal to the to the user logging in, in which case you could apply a security filter. And I'll just write out an example of what that would look like. So right now we're we're applying a, a filter to the notes table, and we're going to say only the rows where the author column equals user email, which is the email of the, the app user logged in currently. So we're only going to display rows uh, that meet this criteria. So what this means is if we, if we look at the notes table, every note has an author. And so right now all those authors are me. Um, and so if Jen, for example, logs into the application once this security filter is applied, if Jen logs in, she'll only see the notes that uh, she has written, and she won't see the ones that I've written. Okay, so that <clears throat> um, those are, I think, some good things to be thinking about as you're connecting your tables. Um, some of that, as you're continuing, you know, it's good to define that early on and scope out the app and figure out, you know, who should see what and be thinking about that as you're connecting your data. Uh, but it's also something you can go back and define later on as you uh, kind of um, uh, build out your app and realize that uh, different functionality might be necessary. So, Peter, it sounds like you're building here in this case something similar to like a CRM application. Would you say that's pretty accurate? Yeah, totally. I think that yeah. that's um, this is the beginnings of, of of a CRM. It's the type of thing where you know, you can just keep building on and keep adding tables. And you know, we've built, Jen, like, you know, we've built more robust kind of CRM examples that, you know, in this case, we have like four tables connected with four different types of, um, you know, information that we're logging about people and meetings. Um, but, you know, we might have like, with a fully baked CRM, if we just keep adding on to this, uh, we could have deals, we could have uh, customers and companies and, opportunities and leads uh, and maybe you know different types of internal contacts and so so we could have a dozen different tables or two dozen or three dozen different tables that then uh, you know we're all kind of defining in different ways and you can um, yeah totally cool that's awesome yeah so and, and that's actually good so thinking about the the use case for this on the right here we have this the emulator Sorry, let me. Um, I have an errant um, chat window right now that is bugging everyone. Let me close that. 
it's just the okay. soundtrack. It's the soundtrack of our day. It's uh, it's some <laughs> nice bloops every now and then. Yeah. <laughs> um. So anyway, so so on the note about like the actual use case and how we're going to be interacting with the app, I think it's a good time to bring up, you know, how we're previewing the app over here. And so as we're making updates to the app, um, the what we call the emulator is updating fairly live. Sometimes you have to hit save before the update shows, but um, those updates are going to be reflected here, and it's just previewed in mobile form. But um, as you're getting started, it's good to know that you can preview the tablet form or open up in a new tab and preview it as a web app. In this case, this particular app, we're kind of starting as it being more mobile centric. Um, but like what Jen was describing, as we as we build in functionality and maybe make it more and more relevant to use on your desktop as well, um, then it's good to be previewing in both forms. And so you can kind of get a sense, you know, if a CRM, uh, that I'd end up, you know, probably using more on my laptop than just on my phone, but I probably use it in both places. All right, so one other area of data uh, that, I, that I think is just good to make sure everyone's on the same page about is we've connected these tables and we've defined a little bit about how we can access the data and modify the data within them. But then a real important part of getting started with AppSheet and kind of setting, uh, setting the foundation for your app is defining the column types. And this is uh, a very, um, what you'll see is as we open up these tables, you'll recognize all these different columns from the different columns in the data source. So for example, contacts, and, and we'll, um, uh, uh, let's see. Contacts have things like first name, last name, email, phone. And we've got some fancy columns around like a Skype, name, an AppSheet ID, LinkedIn, uh, AppSheet community, a status. So all of those things we're defining in the, in the definition here. When you connect the data, AppSheet will try to guess. It'll try, it'll, it'll try to figure out these data types on its own. And it actually does that in a, in a fairly intelligent way based on uh, other similar data sets that it has seen connected in the past. So it'll try to get you most of the way there, but it's it's real important to go through and make sure that these are defined correctly, because this is going to set the stage for especially our actions that that we'll get into next. Um, but but all the interface and just how you can interact with your app and the functionality of the app really depends on the data types. So an example of this is <clears throat> we're going to look at an action that allows you to initiate a phone call. And um, it's real important that the data type be phone in this case, uh, in order for that to work. If it if it just is recognized as say like a text field or a number field, um, then you're going to have a hard time making an action to trigger a phone call. Um, now there are a variety of other column types here that are going to be important for other reasons, and so things like locations, so addresses or lat long um, or x y. Um, there's there's different like media types, so you could uh, embed a video, you can uh, open up files or images. The image type, right, that's very really important for a lot of the interface of the application. So if you have like a gallery view, it's going to depend on there being images in your data. Um, we have in our notes, we have room for files to be attached. So if we look at our notes table, we've got files and links. So in case I wanted to you know, attach some document to the notes that I was jotting down from a conversation, um, I've got room to do that here. But the only way that that's gonna work is if we go to notes and we look at file and we make sure that the column type is file. And when I've done that, and I go to notes, that's going to define that field type. And so you can see here, when I click on that, that gives me opportunity to actually um, attach a file that will then uh, upload to my data source. All right, so <clears throat> there are a variety of other column types here that, that uh, we're not gonna get into all of them, but one really important one to get familiar with is what's called a ref column type. Now the 
the term ref is not immediately obvious. This took me took me a little while to uh, recognize um, what it meant when I was starting out. But between all these tables, there are important relationships that we need to establish. And so, for example, notes can be attached, can be associated with contacts. They can also be associated with meetings. Meetings, when I open this up, meetings will have an organizer and they'll also have participants. And so these, the organizer and the participants, that's drawing from the contacts table. So there's a relationship between uh, meetings and contacts, notes and contacts and meetings. Um, and as you think about your applications, you know, if we were, if, if uh, like what Jen mentioned, if we're gonna build out like a full, full CRM for this, you know, you could have dozens of different relationships between these different tables. And so the way that that happens, in this case, you can see an example. Notes, when I make a new note, I want to have the ability to associate it either with a contact or with a meeting, or both. Um, and the, in order to get this, the option, the option of having a drop down to select, um, what you do is you go into and you see the, uh, the column type. We have contact ID and meeting ID. So just for clarity, our notes, these are two different options. And the column type is going to be a reference. So what this is saying is for this value, reference another table. And then if you open up the little pencil icon here, this will uh, open up the column definition. And you just have to specify the source table. So in this, in this case, the note uh, contact ID is going to reference the contacts table. So now, Every time that uh, this field is opened up, this contact ID, it's looking for the ID from the context table. Okay, well, what is the ID? The ID, or, or what is known as the key, for a contact, in this case, it's an email address. We're assuming that the email is unique to all contacts. And so, um, when I when I'm uh, adding a note and I'm choosing from which contact, it's saying, okay, well, here are all the contacts to choose from. Uh, look for the the key, and then because I have a different label, my label is actually a computed name, and that's just the full name for this user. So that's what that's what's showing up right here. Um, that's what's actually displayed. The label is what is displayed but that key is gonna be whatever is the unique identifier for each contact. Um, now, as a quick example, like I could change the label to be like just first name, for example. Let's see. And so you can see that it updates live there and just picks the first name. Um, <clears throat> all right, so this is a little, it's a little hard at first. There's actually a, a tutorial that we can send as a follow-up link in case it's useful to anyone. But I would say let's let's end on that in regards to setting up these column types, um, and just know that uh, getting these relationships down is is really important for a lot of the functionality in the app. All right, so we're going to gloss over the UX section a little bit so we can really jump into actions. Um, but in this case, the different types of views we've created are pretty straightforward. We have a uh, deck view for contacts, for the meetings, we have a calendar view, and then the notes I think is another deck view. Yeah, so it's pretty pretty straightforward, but the notes maybe it would be better as a card view. Some of the other views that you should be thinking about uh, for your app. Maps are really popular. Um, that's a really great way if you have any location data, uh, maps are become relevant really quickly. Charts, um, charts are great uh, for, for kind of tracking uh, any, any sorts of metrics. They're also really great to embed within a dashboard. Uh, so all of these views can be good, just like standalone views. Dashboard is just uh, aggregating a bunch of views into a single place. So one real quick example of that is, um, here's an app that we'll get to 
um, in a second, just as an example of actions. And this is a dashboard. And so these are all just different individual views that, um, that we've consolidated into one dashboard. Yeah, we kind of love dashboards around here. We're big fans. Yeah, dashboards are great for, especially when you're thinking about using your app primarily on uh, desktop. Um, and so, uh, yeah, we'll show you a couple more examples of this. All right, so <clears throat> let's start thinking about actions. And I wanna take a breather right now. I've been talking at everyone a lot, but um, Jen, are there, I saw a couple questions being posted, but is there anything that would be good to try to address uh, right now before we dive into these actions? There, so the only call out I really wanna uh, give is, especially since there's so many newbies here who are learning about AppSheet, maybe for the first time or, or second time they were on a previous webinar, uh, is how to learn how to use this platform uh, more in depth. Uh, I responded to Bruno, I believe was the name. Uh, I posted a quick link on all of the available resources on how to dive deeper into this platform. And we have a, a great Udemy course that Peter actually put together. It's, we call it our AppSheet Academy. It's free, there's absolutely no charge to use it. Uh, I think it takes, what, three or four hours to get through. Uh, and by the end of it, you'll know actions and more um, in terms of building applications. It's a, a great way to onboard quickly and start building applications quickly. So check it out. Thank, thanks, Jen. And actually just to um, uh, give the community another shout out, there's, a, there's a, a menu item called education in the community. Um, and this is a lot of, this points to a lot of the stuff that, that Jen uh, manages and gets up and running and and I know there's a lot more stuff in the works but some of some of what you just mentioned is available here um, okay so I also uh, we have some questions within in go to that I just wanted to get to real quick and then um, and then let's let's dive into these action types um, so one question uh, about going back to data uh, can we connect Excel sheets yes I, I kind of glossed over that but um, an Excel sheet it, it just needs to be hosted somewhere in the cloud so it could be in uh, OneDrive or Dropbox or box um, and so you can connect to an Excel spreadsheet uh, very just the almost the exact same way that you connect to a Google sheet um, and I guess just to reiterate um, you know, we have a variety of di different data sources available with this account, um, but you can, uh, there, there are a number of different sources that, that you can draw from. Google Sheets and Excel hosted are very common. Also, uh, Cloud SQL sources are, are pretty common. And I'll actually post a support article link in the community thread that lists all of the available uh, data sources that you can connect to. Cool. All right. Um, getting some questions about actions, which is good. And then um, new sheet, import the type defined from, a, okay, import questions with the type defined from a spreadsheet. So Jason, uh, this is a good, uh, good question around, you know, can you um, like import, if you say, if you have a real large number of fields, you don't want to go through and manually select each type. Um, the, there isn't a way to just import the column types um, right now. What I'd say is the way you label the columns is very helpful for determining the type right off the bat. And so as much as you're able to very clearly label your, your column headers, um, that will help you kind of automatically get the right type uh, selected, and so then when you're going through and manually tweaking, um, uh, you'll you'll you won't have uh, a ton of manual work to do there. And then, um, question question around uh, geo geo information, like uh, where an input is entered from. Okay, so I, I this is a little bit uh, back into data and columns, um, and I actually have in the meetings table 
we have the opportunity to put a location for where the meeting has occurred. So what this looks like, if I'm adding a new meeting, right now this column, this field uh, for location is specified as an address type. So I think if I put, um, oh, let's see, Yeah, so just a generic, this is just obviously not a full address, but uh, as you start typing in addresses, um, it will look, it'll, it'll kind of query and prompt um, uh, addresses for you. But another way that you can do this, and also as a way to, to track the actual location of the form input, is if you change this location type to lat long, so now this gives you the option to manually select a location. Uh, and this, this one actually, so then it pulls out the map, it finds where you are, and then you can modify this. But you also can specify if you scroll to the right or open your column definition, you can set, sorry, Glossius, you can set the initial value. You can put in an expression like here. What that does is when the form is opened up by the end user, the initial value is pre-filled with using their uh, GPS location of their device. Um, so there, there are definitely some ways you can use this to help make the content of their app more relevant. Uh, one example of this is, for example, you know, like if you have um, multiple buildings or facilities that people are traveling between and you want to make sure that the content of whatever application they have is just relevant to uh, the closest facility, um, that's that's an easy way of getting started. Just saying uh, you can start using this expression to detect proximity um, and say, okay, only, only show the information relevant for buildings that are within a mile of the person's current location, that sort of thing. Okay, I'm just gonna refresh so we don't save that update. Um, all right, I think there are some other cool uh, questions here. Uh, some are related to the actions. So let, let's let's start digging into these because there are a variety of them. We could spend more than the next half an hour on actions, but I wanna um, just share some ideas for how to get started with them and also how to get a little bit more elaborate with them. Um, Jen, and, and sorry, Jen, just to confirm, is that, does that sound good with you? Is there anything else that you'd like to touch on? I think, I think that sounds great. Okay. <clears throat> All right, I'm gonna put these questions to the side for a little bit. I think it's best to, let's just start by opening up a new action and we'll see what the different options are. And actually, just to, to step back a little bit, actions are not, it's not immediately obvious what we mean by actions, but the best, the first and foremost way to think about actions are they're buttons for users to interact uh, with your application, to go to a link, to change data, to uh, move between different views of your application. Those are the primary ways to start thinking about actions. Um, workflows. Workflows are a little different. Um, they're, they're, it's like automation that you can, sorry about that. It's automation that you can set up to run behind the scenes as data is changing. Um, and so that's something that happens a little bit more automatically as things are occurring with the app data. Um, but they pair well together. And we'll, we'll spend more time on workflows uh, in another session. But just good to be familiar with this uh, section as a whole and these actions some examples are for example this plus sign right here that on the this calendar view it's leading me to a form that's that allows me to input a new row of data to the um, the meetings table and likewise um, I can add a new contact I can add a new note so these are all these are all actions and they're just real simply adding a new row and so these actions are, um, actually I'll just show you the action itself. Um, so there are lots here. 
but here's the uh, ad or contact. So what we're looking at right now is that is this action right here. And you notice that there are differences. There's some actions that are light and some that are a little bit darker. And the way to be thinking about this is uh, the light ones are ones that are called system generated. And these, these actions appear automatically in your prototype based on the data that you've connected. So I didn't, I didn't actually have to deliberately make this button right here. Um, it was created automatically because in the contacts table, I have the ability, I've set the permission level to be able to add rows to this table. And so AppSheet assumes that you're also going to want uh, an action that allows you to initiate that new form entry. Um, so there are a variety of other system generated actions and these are good examples of just sort of basic actions that, to get started. Um, you know, in, in my contact detail, I have a phone number and so system generated action for, for calling phones um, is available here. And we'll, we'll dive into what these fields are in a second. Uh, same with the phone number. You can also uh, initiate text messages. Now the text message action, um, that's not gonna work as well if you're using it as a web app. Um, and so that's the sort of thing that will actually trigger the SMS uh, uh, app on a mobile device. You have other things, we have an email, so you have like a compose email um, uh, action. And then uh, we have the ability to edit this, uh, like edit contacts, so that's another action. Now, you're not, we're not seeing all the actions everywhere in the view, we'll get to that, because we've defined where the actions are gonna show up. But those are some of the basic ones. Some other kind of basic actions include, um, for example, opening up a file. We have the ability to attach files in our notes. And so if I wanna be real deliberate about being able to open up a file, um, then I might use that action. Um, another one is just deleting rows. That's really important. You don't wanna just accumulate, but that also is very dependent upon whether or not the table you've connected has the ability to delete rows. So in this case, I don't actually know, right? Like contacts, we're not, we're not allowing deletes. Um, meetings we are and so um so that's where i would be able to create a delete action uh when it comes to meetings but not for contacts and peter correct me if i'm wrong but your user setting can also dictate if somebody can add or delete rows right yeah so you can get really granular it doesn't have to be just at a full table level yeah that's that's a good question to bring up um thanks so the um, this is just a really basic place to start in defining kind of what, what uh, you're allowed to do with this data. Um, you can start getting more granular within every column, right? And we, do, we, we gloss over this a little bit, but um, whether every individual column is visible, whether you can edit it, whether it's required in forms, uh, that you can just toggle on and off or you can customize with real specific expressions. And so that's where you could say, um, you know, this, uh, in this case, let's say the status of each contact is only editable by, um, you know, an admin of this application versus a user. It's very open-ended and you can real granular about, you know, which pieces of data can be modified. Um, but then you can also add those layers throughout the app. So um, in the UX section, you can say only show certain views to certain users, and you'll see that in the show if. And then the same with these actions. So <clears throat> let's actually pull up an example of, um, let's see, LinkedIn. So this is an example of um, going to a website, so an external link, this action right here, I've applied to the contacts table, and from the drop down of, of options, I've selected go to a website, and then my target website 
is not just a, a static URL. It's the beginning of the profile URL. And this expression that I've written here is just a combination. You can use the, the concatenate expression, or you can also use uh, quotes and an ampersand. And then what I'm doing here is pulling the value from the LinkedIn ID column. So in, my, in this case, I've only added my, my personal LinkedIn ID. So if, I, if everyone wants to go stock man LinkedIn, feel free. But they, uh, the effect then is that this URL uh, will be the destination for this particular action. Now that the icon I've added here is a little user badge icon. And so as you look through now the table of um, uh, users, contacts we have in this app, you'll see the little badge icon. And when I click on it, that just initiates um, a link directly to my profile uh, that we've kind of custom defined that, that's a variable based on the data of that particular row. So that effect of, of variable links can be used in a variety of different ways for a external action that's going to a website. Um, and we'll, we'll, I'll show you a couple other examples, and then and then let's switch over. I want to um, uh, uh, talk about data changes a little bit more. Um, let's see here. All right. <clears throat> so a couple other types, and I know we're getting a lot of questions. So Jen, feel free to if you're seeing anything, please interrupt me. Otherwise, I'll keep uh, uh, driving through. All right. Sounds good. So. Um, Something that uh, that I think is a little less obvious for how to get started with these actions is um, how you can create the effect of like toggling statuses. So uh, let's let's move over. One of the uh, action types revolves around uh, data changes. So we we looked at a few of these links. A lot of these links, for example, initiating a phone call or a text message or going to an actual URL um, that can be defined. Um, we we also have um, this action here on the side that the effect is to toggle between an exclamation mark and a check mark. So Adam, I'll go ahead and click that. You can see that, okay, the, the action changed for him. And then the sync icon, there's, there's actually a data change that's syncing in the background right now. So the way we've set up this action, and it's actually two different actions, is to set the values of columns in this row. And what we're doing here is we're saying, for the context table, I want to change the value of one of the columns in this row, and the column that I want to change is status. So I'm gonna change the value of the status column to needs follow-up. And then I'm gonna make the icon of this action a, a check mark. So now, <clears throat> when this action is triggered, and I'll do it for Arthur, he's on top, and then we'll switch over. Actually, he's, oh shoot, he's further down the list, I'm not sure where he is. All right, and then I initiate the sync. Uh-oh. Oh, okay, all right, so I, I, I botched this up a little bit. For the sake of time, um, this is just a mistake I made in the, the column definition. But what's happening behind the scenes is it's initiating a sync, but it's changing the status, the value of that column. Um, and so, I'll go back and I'll update this. I'm gonna make this application available for, for everyone to access and look at. Um, and in that version, I'll make sure that, um, that I've corrected this error. But you see the effect here is that it's changing the actual value of that column. Um, and in this case, the view then is organized by the status. So if I look at contacts, you can see it's grouped by status. And so as I click that action and change the value of the status, it's reorganizing the contacts into these two different groups. Um, I wanna show another example of um, 
oh, sorry. And one, one last piece to this that is that's important. The reason why the actual icon is toggling is not because, <coughs> excuse me. <clears throat> um, so the reason that why the action is toggling is because there are actually two different actions. And I've set a condition so that only one will show if the status equals contact. So if the status equals contact, the follow-up check mark will show. But if the current status equals needs follow-up, then the exclamation mark will show. And the effect is that as you click them, one of them will disappear and the other one will show. So <clears throat> that's something we dive in a little bit more detail, and this is something you can explore when, when we share this as a sample app. So something that is um, really useful in streamlining form entries, and we have an example of for in this case, is <clears throat> to pre-fill field values with relevant information. So an example here that I've, I've tried to create is, um, you know, we're, we're meeting people and we're having meetings with people and I want to log a note. Um, but I don't necessarily want to go search for that person every time or search for the meeting that's been logged. In this case, there's only two, but as you accumulate meetings, um, you want, like that becomes tedious when all I want to do is just jot down some notes real quick. So what I've done is I've created actions that can be that can initiate um, and, and uh, direct a, a user to the form from uh, the contact or from the meeting, and then it'll pre-fill that form with the contact or the meeting that the person is coming from. So for example, <clears throat> if I have a conversation with Arthur and I have an idea from the conversation, I would want to jot it down as a follow-up. Here's a little note action. And the effect is when I click it, it brings me to that same new note form, but it pre-fills it with um, Arthur's name. And so all I have to do is jot down some notes and hit save, and I've reduced the number of steps for this particular workflow. And so, <clears throat> let's see, the, the action that supports this is what's called an app type. But these are broken into you know slightly different uh, types here. This particular type, right? The action is based on the context table, and the action type is to go to another view within the app. Now you could just simply go to like put in the name of the view, and then so I could uh, I could this action could just simply go to the notes uh, form view. But what I want it to do is to bring the value of that contact with. And so I, in order to do that, I open up the expression assistant. And I'm gonna use a deep link. And <clears throat> there are a few different uh, ways that you can link within your application. This happens to be an example of a link to a form. And in this case, <clears throat> what the expression here is showing is, oops, there we go. Um, Okay, what is the name of the view that we're going to? And that's going to be the, the actual name is called notes underscore form. And we're going to fill the, the value of the contact ID with the column email. So really specifically what this means is we're looking at the contacts. We want to create a new note, um, but we need to specify, okay, who is the contact that's going to be relevant associated with this note? So the contact ID, the value of the contact ID is going to be filled with the value of the email column from the contacts table. And that's the effect, that's the effect in this case, uh, or the, the setup that is creating this effect of bringing over the information and pre-filling it. Now this is just one field that you can pre-fill, but uh, in a scenario like, um, you know, if you are uh, doing a, a facility management or like asset management, um, there there may be reasons why you want to pre-fill dozens of different fields that are unique to uh, the context of where the person is coming from um, in, say, as you're starting up an inspection or a survey, something like that. 
Um, so I want to pause for a moment. Um, we have we have 10 minutes. There there are a few more actions that um, we can keep running through, but I think we are accumulating some good questions. We are, Peter. Do you want to take one from the community uh, right now? Sure. All right. Uh, so Chris on the community is asking a great question about offline capabilities. Uh, so he asks, uh, hi, is there any plan to make AppSheet offline capabilities on a Windows desktop? Um, they use a lot of PDF caching for mobile apps and would like to know if the same will be available for Windows. Uh, do you want to talk about AppSheet offline for a moment? Sure. Well, so it's a, it's a really good topic. Um, the, speci the specific that specific question, I think we'll have to follow up with them on. I'm not, I'm not sure offhand, but it's good to know that in most cases, we actually support offline scenarios really well. Um, and so, especially when you're thinking about, you know, the, the Windows desktop, I'm not exact. We'll, we'll have to, we'll have to think about how he's using it. But the majority of your apps, um, they will run in your browser offline, um, and also in as a web app, so on iOS or Android. If you've started it and then, for example, uh, gone into a basement or into a rural area, your application will keep running. And just like it's doing here in my emulator, it will sync, it'll cache those updates. And as soon as you're reconnected, uh, all the updates will populate back into your data source. So um, there, there might be something very specific going on uh, with, with that user. But in general, that's, that's something that will just happen automatically as you come in and out of service, whether you're in uh, in your browser or on your mobile device. Cool. Um, and then there's another question from Joaquin about processing of data. So their question is, should the processing of data, whether it's merging tables or making calculations, be done outside of AppSheet, let's say on a separate Google Sheet, and then imported as a new table to AppSheet, what is the recommended method, particularly for an advanced Google Sheets user? Yeah, that's a great question. And we didn't, yeah, we didn't really address it, but <clears throat> um, the, the short answer is it's ideal to do, to include your expressions or any calculations in the definition of your app in AppSheet. And, um, and ideally you would remove all or as much as possible from the actual data source. And so um, a real quick example would be, um, you know, for example, if I was calculating, uh, oh geez, I don't have a good example in, in this app, but you know, there's a chance that I would have embedded um, expressions here in this Google Sheet. I would, as I'm uh, preparing this data for connecting to AppSheet, I'd want to remove them, and then I'd want to concentrate on the ability to create um, create those expressions in the actual column formula. Or um, I would say a better place to get started is thinking about virtual columns. Virtual columns are a great way of, uh, and, and actually a prime example of this would be a computed name. So here, here's a real simple way to, to think about it. We have first name and last name values in my Google Sheet. And so instead of having an expression, a cell in that sheet that concatenates the first and last name, um, I'm, I'm relying on a virtual column in AppSheet that does that for me. And that's going to help with the performance of the application if the expression is within your app definition instead of in that sheet. Um, this is a real simple way of getting started and actually AppSheet creates this for you automatically because it, it recognizes that first and last names generally um, are good to expose together in your app um, but you can you can create these manually and they could be um, you know calculating values or it could be you know concatenating things um, another example that happens to be in the actions are these links that i'm generating so for example um, i showed the linkedin case I have a target URL that is a custom expression. This target URL could also be a virtual column. Very frequently, I'll make these as virtual columns. Uh, that's where you'd want to include um, expressions like this. And actually, we just, um, Praveen, uh, the App, AppSheet's founder, has just stopped in to listen in a little bit at the end here. Hey. Hi, just to add one thing to this, uh, to that answer, Peter's answer. If your data is read-only, 
um, and it involves some significant computation, it should be fine to leave that in the backend spreadsheet because um, it never needs to get recomputed again when it's in the mobile app. But if you have any expressions that are dependent on other things that could change, you'd want them to be computed by app sheet in the mobile app rather than have to wait to go back to the spreadsheet for computation. So that's sort of also a useful rule of thumb. Um, uh, if there's lots of data in the spreadsheet, you're doing lots of aggregations, but the data is going to be read only in your app, then it's fine to leave it in the spreadsheet. Cool. Thanks. Um, well, while we have you, for being <laughs> and I, yeah, um, uh, yeah. So, um, Jen, are there? Um, I, I feel like I've seen a couple other questions. Is there, is there anything else we can uh, get to in the community? There's one quick one uh, that I think it would be of high value, and uh, this is from Wendy. Uh, can you trigger an action after a scheduled report has run? Uh, example: After exporting expenses, update the export flag to denote they have been exported. Sequence of actions. Yeah, so this is actually good. Uh, good, another example to bring up. And I, we're getting towards the end of the hour, um, so I think we'll hang around, and I'll show a couple more examples of of some of these actions. Uh, there's some more good questions I think we'll try to get to. Um, for those of you that have to log off, that have a hard stop uh, at the end of the hour, thank you very much for joining. We're going to follow up with some additional resources related to some of this. Um, it'll be posted in the community thread for this office hours. And then uh, you should also get an email recording of this session. Uh, but I would, I would look in the community. You don't have to register in order to get access to it. But I would also recommend uh, registering, and, and if you can participate here, that's always great. Um, so, uh, having said that, if you do have to log off, thanks again. Thanks again for joining. For for those of you that are hanging around, yeah, let's let's think about like sequences of actions. Um, <clears throat> and I am curious to get your take, Praveen, on just sort of best practices. I, I want to show one uh, example of a sequence of actions real quick, and then and then we can talk about how it relates to workflows. So something that I've set up here in this application is the ability to log interactions. And what this is doing is it's basically just keeping track of every time someone changes the status or logs a note uh, with a contact. In order to do this, um, if I look at the, let's look at just my contact. I have the new note action, which will bring me over to the new note field. And then I have the special logged new note action. And this has the same effect of bringing me to that form. But what it's doing in the meantime, it's actually doing two different actions. So this is a log new note action, contacts. And the action type is a, a grouped. So it's an ex executing a sequence of actions. The first, inter the first action that it's initiating is just called log interaction. And that action type is adding a row to this table. And then the second action is the new note action that brings me to this form. So then you can start uh, um, uh, logging things. The effect is the same, but in the background, you can start getting data on, okay, how many people are logging notes? or how many people are, are setting meetings, and when are they doing it? Um, you can start getting some insights. And as you, as you think about like a sequence of actions like this, so that will, it'll trigger other things in the background, um, one more fully built uh, example of this, this is just uh, something I alluded to earlier in our dashboard. We have uh, a variety of content here. It's a different, entirely different application. And as I look, as I preview the content and I click on the link to access the content, it's doing a very similar thing here, which is it's sending me to that URL, <clears throat> but in the background, it's logging a table of activity. It's keeping track of how many people and who click on that link. And that's what's giving us this stats metric, uh, the, the stats dashboard here. And so I can start seeing, okay, how are different pieces of content being accessed over time? 
Um, and, and this is a benefit, this is just one example of benefit of logging actions uh, together. Uh, but you can get really creative with how you do that. Now, to get to the workflow question, can, Praveen, do you, could you actually right. chime in about that? It's just that, yeah, what Peter just showed is really about uh, composite actions that logically act as one thing. So you don't really need to reason that there's multiple changes happening underneath that one logical action. But in workflow rules, whether um, they are change workflows or scheduled reports, you can have a sequence of, of explicit actions that you take um, when the rule runs. And so um, that really directly answers your original question, which is yes, you can do, um, you can take a sequence of steps, one, two, or many, as part of any rule. So, so in this case, I just went into workflows and opened up a new workflow rule. And I'll say that every time a contact uh, is updated, um, and we say, let's say the status of the contact equals, I think the status we have here is uh, needs follow-up. So this is, <clears throat> I've switched over to workflows and we'll do a real quick example of this. Um, then maybe I want to trigger notifications, for example, email or push notification or text message, um, or I could change data behind the scenes or initiate a webhook or generate a PDF. Um, so I could use that action, the status action, to initiate this workflow. And then this workflow can consist of uh, a number, like a whole series of different uh, steps. And so let's say the first action is to send a push notification. And then you go down here and and, and you can add an action. And you can follow that up with, in addition to the push notification, also send an email. And then maybe we can add a third, which would be, let's save a PDF with the details of what just happened. And that I'll, I'll save to a, a Google Drive folder somewhere, uh, and then I can reference that later on. Um, this use case isn't, you know, isn't exactly. Uh, uh, it's not a not a great story, but you can, especially when you're thinking about, um, you know, let's say generating a report that needs to be delivered to the right people or made available in the right places. Um, that's all. That the the whole process there can be defined in a single workflow rule. And then the, in this example, it'd be likely triggered by one of the actions you're using. Um, sorry, so that was long-winded. I wanted to get in a, a variety of little topics there for that. But Jen, do you think that gets to, to that question? Absolutely, thank you, Peter. Cool. <clears throat> um, I think we can keep showing some examples of this. Where I, if, if we keep going for another five or 10 minutes, uh, for those of you that can hang around, uh, I think we'll just keep pulling out some examples here and also keep looking for your questions. If you want to get in anything else here at the end, otherwise what we'll plan on doing is uh, trying to follow up individually with you in the community as much as we can. Um, let's see. A uh, question about authentication. That's good. We haven't, we haven't, uh, uh, looked at the users tab yet. So for those of you, uh, when you get to a certain point, like this application is to a point now where I want to get it in the hands of at least an initial group of users so they can start testing it. Um, it's really important also, you know, as you think about an initial group of users, if you've set specific criteria throughout your applications to affect the visibility or the functionality of different types of users, um, it's important early on to get it in the hands of those different types of users um, because it can sometimes be a little tedious to really um, uh, test the functionality just at yourself as an individual. You can preview as different users. You can also, you know, uh, uh, log in uh, if you have their information, but it's best to just get it in the hands of, of a beta group of end users early on. And the way that you do that or deploy it out to your full team is by sending individual invites or adding an entire domain. So in this case, 
maybe I want to make this app available to everybody at AppSheet. And so then you can see how that domain whitelist shows up. Um, and then maybe I want to make sure that um, Jennifer is added. Um, and I'll not send her the invite email, um, but I want her to be a co-author so that she can help uh, collaborate with me on this application. And I can just send her the link. Um, now, for, for everybody else in the company, you know, I've, I've whitelisted that domain, but they don't have an invitation yet. So if I go to links, I can send out the mobile installation link um, or the browser link. And so um, if you're thinking about, you know, if this app is going to be used primarily as a web app, I'd send the browser link uh, versus mobile as an install link. And then the way to get started with authentication is you can define, all right, what is the primary provider? The default is Google, but you can set some of these other providers. And then um, in some of our business plans, you can also, there are other integrations for customizing uh, auth groups um, based on uh, you know some other platforms you might be using to, to manage contacts. Okay. Um, we're getting a lot of good questions. There's a uh, question around barcode scanning. Um, this is great. So can I use it on a desktop connected to a barcode scanner? Uh, yes. This is something I don't have an example to show you right offhand, but um, the barcode scanners, most of the time, they act just like other input devices. And so if you are, say for example, searching and you scan a barcode, um, then it will input into the search. Or for example, if you're adding a new, if you're checking in a piece of inventory and you have a field that requires that product ID and you scan uh, the barcode, it'll automatically input it into the field. And depending on how you get creative with your forms, uh, you can really streamline that input process or the search process. Um, so yes, uh, most short answer is barcode scanning works really well. It's also something that you can do directly from your mobile device. So desktop, that's a great scenario. Um, but also on your mobile device, if you have enabled, let's say, um, you know, let's say we've got like barcodes on uh, user badges that represent email addresses. Then in the column definition for that email, if you scroll down to the bottom, you can enable scannable. And actually a, a user ID probably would also have NFC. So you can enable both of these for, for scanning the barcode or scanning the NFC tag on a user ID card. Um, and then the effect here is when I hit search, then um, these icons kind of represent that the barcode or NFC. And I, it won't preview here in the emulator for you, but if you try this and then open it up on your mobile device, you'll you'll see that both of those options are enabled. Okay, these are awesome questions. We're covering, we're jumping around a lot, but covering a lot of, of valuable points. Um, and uh, Michelle, Okta, yes, there's an integration with Okta for your authentication question. So, okay. Jen, how are you? How are you doing in the community? I think we're in a good spot. I can certainly follow up with anyone uh, that has any lingering questions after the session's over. Okay, I think um, I'll end on one one last action. That's it's a relatively simple one to get set up, but I just really like it for anything that is like regional or location based. And I've I've added this action to a national parks kind of example app. Um, we like the national parks app as a, as a simple example, just because they're great photos that, um, that can be featured with it. And the action that I've set up here is a weather action. 
And so it's really simple. It's just going to a website and the target for this website is a, a weather.gov location. Um, and what I'm doing is I've customized where the lat long will be for that weather forecast. Um, because in my data, in my um, national parks data, I have uh, lat long columns. So what I'm doing is just bringing those, I'm incorporating them into my action target. So right there and right there. And then the effect is if I click into one of these, you see, okay, we're looking at Acadia National Park in Maine. And there are a few different actions. One is driving directions, one is a map. Um, and this icon for weather I've selected is showing up. And when I click on that, it's pulling in the location of that row and then dropping me right into uh, uh, forecasts for uh, gardens of Acadia, Maine. Um, and so I just like this one. I like uh, plotting, you know, uh, uh, parks to go to or campgrounds to visit. And so to have like a quick link to the, pull up the live weather forecast, this is just kind of a fun one uh, to end on and pretty useful. So we'll send examples. We'll send this uh, application example, and then also this note manager, which has a bunch of uh, different actions that we've accumulated in it for you to check out and explore and, and, and go back and, and visit. But there's a ton more that we, ton more detail we could go into. So please follow up in that community thread with any, any additional questions about these. And Jen and I will be, um, will be fielding them. And then anyone else in the community, there are a bunch of other people um, that will will have uh, more and probably better ideas than even we can have, um, and so uh, you know, getting ideas from from them as well is, is useful. Jen, is is there anything else at your end that you'd like uh, to add in here, or should we wrap things up? I, I think we're in a good place to wrap things up. All right, cool. Well, uh, for those of you that hung around, uh, thanks for staying long today. You should get the recording if it's helpful. Um, and if there's anyone else on your team that you think would benefit from seeing some of this, you can share that recording uh, or put them in touch with us and we can help them get signed up. We'll have another office hours in two weeks. We're trying to do it every other Tuesday. And um, and then we'll uh, we'll make sure that you guys have invitations to those as well. So and for, for those that are here, uh, new to AppSheet, uh, from the AppMaker to AppSheet transition, our next uh, webinar in that series is next Wednesday morning as well. So stay tuned for details on that. Got it. Thanks, Jen. All right. Thanks, everyone. Have a good rest of your week.